What are Cinnabites and what is the Lemeshond box? Backstories explained in detail. We have all loved and admired the fascinating Hellraiser franchise, but how little do we know about the backstories that shaped this Clive Barker classic? The hellish world in the Hellraiser movies has a bloody history that is hundreds of years old, and there is more to it than you can imagine. There have been other cinematic depictions of Hell, and many of them have been quite successful and vivid. However, what we see in Hellraiser is the most unique of them all, a massive labyrinth where the mighty Leviathan resides. We have feared the Cenobites and Pinhead, but they are merely servants of the Leviathan, who is more like the Hellraiser version of Satan. My god, Leviathan, lord of the labyrinth. It is an entity that turns people into Cenobites in the first place, and Hell is simply full of these unfortunate souls. And at the center of all this evil is the critical element, the lament configuration puzzle. In this video, we will dig deep into the lore of the Cenobite. We will explain in detail all the backstories surrounding the mysterious puzzle box and the creatures that will give you a new outlook on the Hellraiser narrative. Before we get into the explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, Please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. What is the puzzle box? As we have already mentioned, at the center of the Hellraiser storyline, there is the mysterious puzzle box that even featured in the original works of Clive Barker. The Lemeshon box is the best known version of these cubes, named after its creator, Philip Lemeshon, who was an 18th century architect and designer. He was a devotee of the occult, with paranormal worlds fascinating him. He is known for creating the first puzzle box, which was the Lament Configuration, or the Box of Sorrows. When someone solved this box, a dolorous bell would be heard tolling at a distance. It would be the announcement for the arrival of the dreaded Cenobites. You could say it is more of a key that unlocks the hellish world that unleashes horrors stored within. Whenever someone solves the puzzle, a bridge is created that permits beings to travel in either direction between both dimensions. Throughout the series, there has been a raging debate that tries to explore the portrayal of Hell. Is it similar to the Christian iteration, or is it simply some sadomasochistic zone that holds unspeakable terrors within? This is a holocaust waiting to wake itself. A brief history of the puzzle box. Philip Lemeshon might have created the first box, but the history of the demon summoning block dates back thousands of years. Ever since humans have believed in the concepts of heaven and hell, there were people who sought to learn more about the entrances to these realms. It is believed that the keys to them vary greatly, and they often mask themselves in the appearance of fetishes, or a fantasy that is intended to lure the victim into its clutches. The puzzle box is the most commonly used artifact that can be used to gain access to the hellish dimension of pain and suffering. This is cubicle in shape, an image that can be found in most of the ancient cultures and religions of the world. In the Yentra documents, which belong to the tantric traditions of Indian religion, you will find similar designs used to summon evil. Philip Lemeshon's creation simply unlocked the forbidden knowledge, and his skillful work put together the notorious puzzle box. The secret could only be solved through obsession, and those who managed to put the pieces together would come face to face with the reality of hell. While he is credited for the first such cube, the concept dates back to the 13th century, where Albertus Magnus, a famous philosopher, had provided the original design. Philip was an avid scholar, and he took an interest in the artifacts of antiquity. His idea is borrowed from many of the designs he came across while scanning through some infamous sources. 
This is where you need to know a little bit about Philip Lemachon, the person. He was a member of the Freemason, and while he was attending a lodge meeting, he was acquainted with Frederick Braun. The two indulged in some discussions regarding the artistic difficulties that proved to be a hindrance in the creation. For instance, the unyielding properties of steel were going to be a serious problem for him, and he had to find the right material to create the box. Frederick Braun lent him a treatise of secret geometry. This piece of literature was extremely helpful because he learned of Ries Kunst, a scholar in astrology, mathematics, and geometry. Kunst had titled the graphic designs as Cinnobite's Welcome and Spiral of Desperation, and his book was full of complex designs that were exactly what Lemachon wanted to create. Kunst himself was inspired by the designs of Albertus Magnus, and his creation was made from a metal that was previously unknown to him. It was more like a dark polished stone, or some kind of lacquered wood that felt somewhat like a warm soft metal. Its special features were that it was hard and had no significant radiant heat. Was this going to be the key element to frame the puzzle box? Philip Lemachon later used the resources of Geoffrey Chance, an English book collector who possessed many esoteric volumes. Initially, Philip found it hard to comprehend, but with time, he was delighted by the numerous reference to the Cinnabites in these works. This is when he first had the idea of the Cinnabites as something demonic, and the frequent references intrigued him further. It's a box. It's just a box. There are many boxes. There have been many boxes since the beginning of time. Philip Lemachon himself came across several works that implied that Cinnabites had been invoked before as well. As per the text of John Dee, Cinnabites have their own realm where they hold their sinister secrets. There is another interesting account that he came across, which suggested that Livingston Merrick had journeyed into Hell after he summoned the Cinnabites using a magic formula. His visit there surprised him when he saw that instead of Satan, a geometric form suspended in the air ruled hell. His research took him to the final box of Albertus Magnus and the pages that contain the authentic formula to summon the Cinnabites. He took the help of the Cinnabite Baron and constructed the first of the many puzzle boxes that would be referred to as the Lament Configuration. He followed this up with many more such cubes that held the riddle to unlock the hellish dimension. The answer was always in the heart of the user, and it was their ultimate desire as the solution. Oh, doesn't actually do anything. So every puzzle box was uniquely made for an individual, and they would all require a different solution. It is believed he made over 270 such figures, and that there was a time when these were quite popular across Europe. However, many who purchased the puzzle boxes were dead or missing under mysterious circumstances. <laughs> no surprises why. <laughs> then, Lemachon vanished in thin air and the boxes continued to change hands. Was Lemachon a victim of his own monsters? We will never know. He just vanished, leaving behind a number of these puzzle boxes. During the World Wars, a number of them got destroyed, and others got damaged and fired. However, some remained scattered all around the world, always leaving the option for the Cinnabite to make a comeback. The Hollow Heart, the Triumph of Judas, and Lament Configuration are three of the best known in history. They are a linking mechanism between our world and yours. How do the puzzle boxes work? It could be activated simply by pressing on the hidden pressure points in a particular order. The shape of the box keeps changing as the various points are pressed, and every finger has to be used to squeeze the surface. Once it has been solved, the portal to the labyrinth would open, and the Cinnabites would arrive with the ringing of a bell. As they make their entry into the human world, huge gusts of wind and lightning shatter everything caught in the way. Once they arrive, the Cinnabites are supposed to escort the puzzle solver back to the labyrinth. Then begins the eternal torture. 
and the room is restored to its former state without a trace of what just happened. However, there is one small catch. One could also use the puzzle box to send the Cinnabites back to their world if they could reverse the sequence. It could also be reshaped by the Cinnabites such that it becomes powerless. This can be reversed by human hands. And if it is done while the box is in the labyrinth, many trapped souls are released back into the human world. So even if someone has been taken away by the Cinnabites, it does not mean that they have no chance of returning back. Cinnabite. Now that we have spoken so much about the box that summons the Cinnabites, let us give you an insight into what a Cinnabite exactly is. These are basically extra-dimensional beings that are servants of Leviathan. Some unearthly artifacts can help them reach Earth's reality through a portal in time and space. They vary in their appearance and motivations, and even their philosophies and abilities are vastly different. However, there is one thing in common in them, and this is their horrible mutilations or body piercings and fetishes. They are vicious and have no empathy towards their victim. One could say that their attributes are similar to traditional demons, and it is their unorthodox definition of pleasure that sets them apart. It is wrong to say they were immoral because they are simply loyal to their craft. The film version does show a more severe side to the Cinnabites, but they are dedicated to their duties. In the movies, the Cinnabites would decide exactly when to appear, and they took various forms to manifest themselves. Their weapons of choice seem to be their hooked chains, and they all have some degree of telekinetic powers. They also possessed incredible superhuman strength, and were not susceptible to pain or damage. Pinhead is of course the most notorious among them, feared and admired by an entire generation. Where do Pinhead and the Cinnabites come from in Hellraiser? Their appearance has varied from one movie to another, and even the way they were summoned kept changing. In the first film, they came after a puzzle box was solved. The box. You opened it. We came. However, the following sequels offered very different versions. For instance, in the third entry, Cinnabites are shown to be created from humans who open the portal. While in Hellraiser 4 Bloodline, the Cinnabites are just a form of an upgraded hell. The consequential movies have not been impressive by any standards, and they all dealt with the fates of those who solved the box. In fact, by the last movie, Hellraiser Judgment, there is no need for a puzzle box to summon these creatures as simply an invitation suffices. Don't waste your time, folks. We advise sticking to the first few only. Earth is pain. How can someone become a Cinnabite? The writing is rather inconsistent in this regard, and there can be multiple answers to this question. It might seem obvious that anyone who opens the Lament configuration becomes a Cinnabite later, but it is revealed in Hellraiser 2, when the Hell Priest stops the other Cinnabites, that an individual must desire himself to visit the realm before he is taken to the labyrinth. It is not hands that call us. It is desire. This is clearly contradictory to what the priest said in the first film, where he claimed that Kirsty would have to accompany them to hell. You solved the box. We came. Now you must come with us. Taste our pleasures. It is probably a bit of both, where someone has to first open the puzzle box, and then willingly want to be part of the devilish world, where pain is pleasure. Shit. What is the end goal of Cinnabites? We'll tear your soul apart. This is again something that varies significantly from one Cinnabite to another. They seem to be pretty ambiguous in their roles, and you see all kinds of Cinnabites with different motives. Broadly speaking, they are simply serving Leviathan and doing their duty. However, their evil nature is not consistent. For instance, Pinhead, 
is fairly neutral, while the Doctor is simply psychotic. Then again, some of the Cenobites are totally brainwashed with no memories of their past life. They thrive in pain that they inflict upon themselves and others. There are some who remember their past and are more calculated in their moves. It seems that they do not have a personal goal as such. They are merely sentries of their hellish zone performing their duty of collecting the souls that the box enticed. Who keeps coming? The demons! The demons! Demons? Demons are real? Then what the fuck is that? Are Cenobites angels or demons? The answer lies in one of the dialogues of Pinhead. He says that Cenobites are demons to some and angels to others. And that is exactly what they are. Who are you? So, demons to some. <laughs> angels to others. Pinhead does things that cause immeasurable pain to others, and it is easy to say that he is evil. However, in the second movie, we are reminded that he was once a simple man named Elliot Spencer. We slowly have a reason for the evil that he does, and we see that he is more duty bound than anything else. There are other stories that simply show him working towards his own agenda and doing evil stuff to gain more power. Yes, there is an ambiguity towards the nature of the Cenobites, and if you consider the behavior and actions of Pinhead or any other member of his species, we personally prefer the lawful evil part where there is some justification for the things they do and the torture that follows. A villain without a purpose is hardly intriguing. How Clive Barker got the idea of the character designs. Pinhead and the other Cenobites are one of the most iconic horror villains ever. Clive Barker took his due time and research to accomplish this feat, and the end product is a monstrous entity to say the least. As for Pinhead, Barker used inspiration from all over the world to put together the design. First thing that will strike you about Pinhead is that he is extremely intelligent and articulate. This reminded us of Count Dracula, and the mannerisms and witty one-liners only affirmed our memory. Your soul is mine, and mine alone. Clive Barker was inspired by African fetish sculptures, and the aesthetics bear a strong resemblance to some of these. His visits to the S&M clubs all over the world helped him create a convincing sadomasochism angle in the character. In general, a Cenobite refers to a religious leader, but Barker's unforgettable creation makes us associate it with something horrifying. He called them hell priests and wanted them to resemble super butchers who could do unspeakable things without batting an eyelid. Pinhead has been the defining character of the franchise, thanks to the brilliant work of Doug Bradley. But Barker's designs also deserve a lot of credit. The pins going through his skull and face, and the terrifying looks allotted to the other Cenobites made us fear every puzzle box we came across in our life. What is the point of the Hellraiser film franchise? Well, this has to be one of the most obvious questions that comes to mind when someone watches the movie. What did the makers actually intend to prove through their narrative? We believe one of the core lessons through these stories is the demonic potential that is present within humans. Everyone has their set of secret desires, and there is hardly a censor to these suppressed thoughts. When someone gets the pathway to their weak moments to fulfill these desires, they are ready to go to any extent to accomplish them. They do not care about the consequences, and trade just about anything to finish their mission. I called you to trade her for me! <laughs> trade. If you consider this narrative, then the Cenobites start making sense. When the urge to accomplish something is so intense, Humans are prepared to go to any extremes, even if it means that they would be a skinless monster living on a dirty mattress eating vagrants. But the puzzle box comes with its set of rules, and there is always a price to pay. 
Pinhead is more like a gatekeeper, safeguarding those rules. The series often comes across to people who are trying to find a loophole in the rules, but the outcome is usually the disturbing and graphic gore that is a trademark of the franchise. We have seen time and again in the story that when people get their desires fulfilled, they turn into a monstrous version of themselves. But were they already the terrible monstrous entity? simply masked by their acceptable version of themselves? We can get another interesting viewpoint if we consider the background of the author. Clive Barker is openly gay, and just before Hellraiser was filmed, Pope John Paul II stated that homosexuality was evil. Clive Barker was quite upset with this comment, and it is possible that the movie is a form of protest for the lack of support shown by the Pope. The hellish dimension could be purposely made different from the version of Abrahamic faiths. Cenobites are beings that have accepted their form. However, it might be that their pleasure is supposed to be a perversion. Monsters threatening normality? And what better way to stamp his authority than to introduce Pinhead and his minions in a well-crafted plot? Our final words. The discussions, debates, and interpretations around this captivating plot will continue for decades. After all, Hellraiser is a cult classic that is not going to be forgotten anytime soon. You may or may not agree with some of the views we expressed, but you will certainly admit that this thrilling horror franchise has given us some very entertaining content. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.